Good evening and welcome to today's session on BIC Streams, Grey Matters, conversation with women leaders defying ageism in the pandemic. We have a rock star panel today and joining us are Rohini Nilikani, Arundhati Nag, Nirupama Rao, Geeta Narayan and Rekha Menon. Welcome everyone and thank you Rohini for putting this panel together. With that, over to you Rohini. Thank you, Raghu. Namaskar, everyone. It's good to be back at BIC uh, doing another show with all of you listening in. Thank you so much to BIC. Thank you um, to all of you who have tuned in. And most of all, thank you to my dream panel who all agreed immediately when I called them to be on this show. So I thought of doing this show five months into the pandemic because, uh, you know, there's been a lot of very serious conversation about everything. I thought today we will also look at some of the lighter side of things while very much focusing on serious societal questions such as ageism, which, as I said in the introduction uh, that I wrote, it's like in these five months, sometimes we feel as though time has just frozen. And yet the societal permafrost seems to be melting and all kinds of strange things are coming out. Things like neighbors suspecting neighbors, uh, people treating older people very differently than they uh, used to even in December. So thinking of them as more fragile, vulnerable, should be kept at home. In fact, old people are not allowed into parks. They're not allowed into jungle safaris. They're not allowed to do so many things. So that's sort of created a, a kind of invert, strange mirror for older people who perhaps do not see themselves in the way that pandemic society does. So I thought, why not get four iconic women leaders of Bangalore who clearly defy any idea of ageism to talk about this issue? How does it feel when society holds up a mirror that perhaps is different from the mirror you see when you wake up in the morning and ask them about that, ask them about their leadership. And also, if you are lucky, ask them to give us a little bit of peek into their lives and their journey in these last five months. So as you know, I have Nirupama Rao, um, uh, a former ambassador, foreign secretary, former ambassador to the two big rival countries, two superpowers today in this world, USA and China. Um, there are so many things about her that I hope will come out other than her diplomacy career. We have Arundhati Nag. Uh, what can I say to Bangaloreans and others about her? Single-handedly has helped to keep local arts and culture thriving through Ranga Shankara. We have Geeta Narayanan, who's not only worked to co-found Aditi Malia School, but Srishti, the new design school in Bangalore, well, not so new anymore, that has brought together technology, design, and young people in a really remarkable way, creating a successful institution in a short time. And last but certainly not least, we have Rekha Menon, uh, chairman of Accenture India, and uh, a real role model for women in the corporate sector throughout the country. So welcome to my panel. And as usual, we are going to, the format is each one of them will get three minutes. Guys, it's three minutes, maximum four minutes for you all to say what you'd like to about your journey through this pandemic. And then I will ask you a few questions and then we'll turn it over to the audience. To the audience, I say, um, Please send lots of questions, but please make them very clear and simple so that I can don't have to paraphrase too much because I'll be reading and talking to my panel. So make them simple and clear and so that I can read them out and address to the panelists. Thank you very much. And off we go. So I'm going to start with Geeta. I'm going to start with you. Uh, so would you tell us how it has been for you in these uh, few months? Um, uh, you know, in March, when we actually went into lockdown for the first time, uh, it, it, it was, uh, it, for me, it was something that horrified me. I was quite honest to say it. I was very upset. Uh, and I had a kind of sense of disbelief. You know, is this really happening in my country? Am I, uh, am I going to be, you know, this is going to be all over the country. No flights in, no flights out, no cars, no nothing. And 
just just not prepared. And then at home, you know, I don't know whether everybody else went to this, but Ravi and I went to this. Oh God, have you made a will? Where is our will? Where did we keep thing? Have you got where are your passwords for all your laptop in case you fall sick? And we went through this kind of complete chaotic dissonance, which uh, showed our both our vulnerability and our complete lack of being ready for personal isolation and coping independently. And uh, while many people I talked to said, you know, oh, I'm loving it and I'm quiet. I just felt that it was eerie and the, the, the city felt eerie. There was an abnormal kind of stillness uh, even around this house, which sometimes shakes with the amount of traffic on the road. And slowly the sense of uh, discomfort turned to anger, you know. It slowly became, I mean, I became very angry. I just kind of said, this cannot be happening. There has to be another way to look at it. There was a sense of loss. I loved my life before the lockdown. I, you know, I loved everything that I did. I do it with a passion. I didn't have any apologies for being old. And this loss of my friends, of my family, of mobility, about doing unexpected things, you know, the kind of new ideas you get. I mean, I've run into Aru on a plane. I've run into you on a bus on a in the airport on our way somewhere, these unexpected meetings, these conversations, uh, suddenly there was the sense that, oh gosh, none of that is happening. And there was also a sense that you, I'm a person who looks at sensorial stimulus. I, I also work, work out of intuition and there was no stimuli. You know, there were no meetings, there were no conversations, there were no books that you accidentally came across in a bookshop. And, and I felt a sense of loss. That doesn't mean, of course, I wasn't doing anything. I mean, I have been for the, from that time for five and a half months, I've done busy work on Zoom. I've been on Zoom land almost all the time, organizing, managing. And I think the only faint hope I have is perhaps there's an imagination opportunity here for designing something different. But that, that's what life has been for me um, in the pandemic. Thank you, I'm so glad. Uh you took off on that note because most people kind of are in a bit of denial and they say, oh, everything is all right. The birds are singing and, you know, everything has been fine for me. So I'm glad you very honestly brought out that it was a shock. You know, it felt like chaos. It felt like, how are we going to handle this? Hmm. But then you found yourself handling it. Yes. So, of yes. course, we're going to come back to you um, uh, for, with several follow-on questions. Thank you for making that sweet and short <laughs> and sharp. Uh, so uh, let me go to you, Nirupama, uh, for your four minutes uh, of how has the last six months been for you? Thank you, Rohini. Uh, well, the last six months uh, for me, uh, we're in a totally unexpected phase of our lives. And um, I don't know if the siege of Stalin or Leningrad would have been like this you know, a siege of 900 days with so many people falling victim. Uh, I'm fascinated by that image. When I came back, um, I came back to India from Sri Lanka. I had gone to Sri Lanka, in fact, to record an album, a music album. And I came back uh, to Bangalore on the 15th of March. And very soon afterwards, you know, we heard about the rising number uh, of uh, COVID cases, uh, not so much in India, but certainly the alarm bells had started to ring. And then the prime minister announced that first lockdown on, I think, from the 24th of March. It was, it was a, a surreal kind of experience because overnight, everything seemed to change. We just had about four hours of notice to adjust to the, this new normal, as it were. So, uh, how did I adjust to it? Did I rail against it? Did I rage against the dying of the light? Uh, no, I really didn't because uh, I'm somebody, although I've lived in the midst of tumult and, you know, in the madding crowd all my life, I have always uh, engaged with solitude. I really have loved solitude. And uh, although this is a different kind of solitude, but um, being able to shut out the world, literally, as it were, overnight uh, came, yes, as a surprise, but I kind of adjusted to it uh, quite uh, quickly, I must say, because I, suddenly everything went quiet, everything was silent, and uh, the, literally the sounds of silence, you, you felt that. 
And uh, then I began to really plan about how I should deal with this. Of course, there was the music that I had recently recorded in Sri Lanka. So I spent the first you know, fortnight, just we looked at the, at the tracks, we looked at how to improve them. So I was busy with that. And uh, it was a bunch of songs that, in a sense, uh, somehow uh, uncannily sort of fed into the, the uh, atmosphere around me. Like one of the songs was called Spring Fever. And this was a new kind of spring fever that we were all experiencing. Uh, the message of the song was so much more upli uplifting. So I looked at that and I, and I began to, you know, uh, write a great deal. Uh, I, you know, I'm writing a book. So I had neglected, uh, you know, the last few chapters, which were still incomplete. So I began to focus on that, uh, complete my reading. And, uh, and, I, and I certainly established a certain a tempo, which uh, unfortunately, I must say, sad to say that did, I did not keep up. So uh, in, by the middle of June, uh, we had the Galwan Valley incident with China. And uh, I just was inundated with requests to speak for interviews and webinars. And that has more or less gone on in, until today. In fact, even tomorrow, I have one with uh, an institute in Beijing where we are going to talk about the aftermath of that incident on the relationship with China. So even if the world is without you, I think you can't escape the world because today's technology and all the innovative practices that we have for communication do not leave you alone. So you are very much with the world. But um, you know, today when I was reflecting about uh, you know, what these narrow walls of confinement mean for each and every one of us. And I'm not talking about one's age as a factor here, because more or less all over the world, thinking people, busy people, people who've been terribly busy with their professions, with their interaction with the outside world, are suddenly you know, expressing or, or experiencing this, uh, uh, this uh, surroundings of confinement everywhere. And I came across this uh, poem by William Wordsworth. All of you know William Wordsworth from school. And um, it was, it's called Nuns, Nuns, you know, like Catholic nuns. Nuns fret not at their convent's narrow room. Now, we are not nuns, but uh, in a way, this solitude resembles perhaps that kind of uh, uh, you know, isolation that some of them must experience in their lives. So this is what the poem says, and I'll read it out. Nuns fret not at their convent's narrow room, and hermits are contented with their cells, and students with their pensive citadels. Maids at the wheel, the weaver at his loom, sit blithe and happy, bees that soar for bloom. High as the highest peak of furnace fells, will murmur by the hour in foxglove glove bells. In truth, the prison into which we doom ourselves no prison is, and hence for me, in sundry moods, twas pastime to be bound within the sonnet's scanty plot of ground, pleased if some souls for such their needs must be, who have felt the weight, and this is true for all of us, who have felt the weight of too much liberty, should find brief solace here there as I have found. So this is a kind of brief solace, I think, in some ways. I do miss uh, my children particularly, and uh, especially, you know, I keep in touch uh, with, with both our sons and and the one in Washington is usually, you know, at the receiving end of all my, you know, uh, worries and uh, concerns. And uh, this, uh, this image that struck me from the Russian writer, Vasily Grossman, in which um, he receives a letter from his mother, who has been corralled in her town's Jewish ghetto after the Germans have captured it. And her, her, his mother writes to him, and I feel that very much in my heart today when I think of my son in America. Uh, and the mother says, when you were a child, you used to run to me for protection. Now in moments of weakness, I want to hide my head on your knees. I want you to be strong and wise 
I want you to protect and defend me. So I'd like to stop here for the moment. Wow, wow. Kya baat hai. That gave us so much food for thought and uh, I'm not at all surprised, but you've been a really showcase of your many skills and talents and uh, uh, that was really beautiful. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to come back to you on other questions of, about diplomacy, etc. a little later. But can we go to you, Rekha, for your thoughts on these past few months? Okay. Um, so for me, if I have to uh, uh, summarize it in one word, it's been dichotomous. Um, you know, frenetic and yet hitting the pause button. Um, uncertainty and yet a sense of calm pain at what was going on with either immediate uh, with relatives or family or uh, outside in society and gratitude uh, for what I had. And um, like all times of crisis, uh, both learnings um, and unlearnings. So at work, it was really frenetic. It was a testing period for us and quite challenging really, because you know we have about 200,000 people in India. And when the lockdown hit at short notice, uh, we had to first make sure that uh, our people were safe. And, and then we had to sort of uh, uh, balance and make quick decisions so that we could continue to meet our client commitments uh, and meet the very rapidly evolving government guidelines, which were different by every state. Um, so trying to track all of them down. So had to stay agile, had to be very responsive. Uh, and then had to make sure that our people were motivated and engaged while working in a very different environment, which was virtual now, right? Um, and then as we were uh, navigating our own business, we had to make sure, we wanted to ensure that we were taking care of our community um, and stepping up. Um, and so we stepped up to support the at-risk populations, which were many, and the frontline healthcare workers. And I have to thank our people at Accenture who really stepped in. And then simultaneously, we were collaborating, you know, with the government of India to help where we could, you know, from a technology perspective, building AI-based chatbots to support information dissemination, et cetera. And while all this was going on, I took on a new role, uh, in addition, an additional role, and uh, took on the vice chair role at NASCOM. Um, and so that was baptism by fire, uh, virtually. Um, and, you know, plunged into uh, working with the industry body to support our members, um, and, uh, you know, make the regulate, uh, support the policy regulatory changes that were needed for remote working for and the economic consequences of the lockdown uh, and the pandemic worldwide. Um, so that was on the work front. On the personal front, there was really a pause button. Um, you know, there were last minute changes to planned events, whether it was um, a family holiday or the wedding of our son that we were planning. Um, but priority was safety of family. Um, and then uh, it was keeping my personal commitments to the community, um, whether it was uh, in the role that I play with, you know, XLRI on their board, and how do we keep education going for uh, the students uh, in this environment or with Akshara Foundation or Pratham Books. So trying to support the responses to the pandemic, right? Um, so, which is why I was saying it was frenetic and and calm. And uh, through this period, there were, um, you know, there were some uh, reflections and uh, lessons that I was looking at saying, through these five, six months, what have I learned? Um, one was focusing just on the essentials, just letting go of everything else. Um, second was really the resilience of uh, human spirit. And you know, it was remarkable uh, uh, how people responded and stepped up. Um, the third was importance of community, really, and A, the need for community, but also the importance of community and the resourcefulness everybody showed. And for me, the other was really um, appreciation, gratitude for what I had um, compared to when I looked outside, really. And so it was really made me think through and create an inventory of what for me was a meaningful life and what was DC, which was uh, before COVID and what's going to be after COVID, uh, which again is an uncertain environment yet and we don't know the answers yet. So that's my uh, six months reflection. 
you're on mute. Maybe I could also ask you to add a couple of sentences about your, uh, because you used to be a runner, you're a cyclist. Talk a little bit about the, the physicality of your life. How, just a little bit before we move to Arun. Oh my God, the first few, uh, first week or two, it was cabin confined constraint. That's the only words I can use because uh, you're right. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, I am physically active. I exercise regularly. Um, uh, swimming pools were shut, uh, the gym was shut. Uh, and then I discovered that I could uh, uh, change and rediscover cycling uh, and you know, leave early in the morning and go cycling or go for a walk. And um, during this time, I actually completed the Oxfam 100 kilometer challenge, etc. So I adapted and I changed uh, and uh, took new uh, activities on. Thank you. Thank you, Rekha. Of course, we'll come back to you. Uh, but as my audience can see, uh, age seems to be just a number. So Aru, coming to you, uh, how has it been for you? Because your industry certainly has suffered a lot. But right now, focus more on yourself and your personal journey. We'll certainly come back to questions about each of your industries and uh, uh, professions. Uh, I can't separate myself from my industry because I really do not have another life. So <laughs> it's going to be very difficult to separate the two, which must be true for everyone. But uh, for me, particularly because I do not have any other skill, really, I only know how to cook. That's the only other skill I know. And all my life from the age of 16, I have done nothing but dream of theater and live in the theater and my biggest dream of uh, being able to build a theater is also over. So here we were, uh, I thought I was going to hang up my boots. I thought I had given 45 years to theater and uh, done the most logical thing that an actor can do or a theater person can do is build a theater and really hand it over to the community. And I thought I had seen almost everything that theater had to offer. But here comes this whammy from the back and uh, just shatters everything around you and says, no, what you did is over. You're not going to be able to practice your art. So what are, how are you going to change it? How, the very basic premise of the art has been challenged and that is interacting with another person. All you need is one person in the audience to have a performance happening and we are, we have been deprived of that. So uh, it took me some time. It really took me. I didn't believe this was happening. If six months ago, someone would have told me that Ranga Shankara will be closed and you will be sitting in the auditorium doing a webinar like I am right now. I'm sitting in the auditorium, empty seats behind me. I would probably have hit the person or I would have stopped talking to that person. I would have been so angry or found it completely ridiculous. But here we are and into the fourth, fifth month, we open the theater every day. We close, clean it and close it, make sure the mosquitoes are not there. So something is, something very diabolic in, uh, in a way of change is taking place inside me. And uh, I could see how my staff was behaving. It's a very small team of just eight people who run the place. I saw change because I do not have any interaction at home. I live alone. And uh, my only child is not here in India. She's in Singapore. So uh, my only interaction with human beings is also at the theater, is because of the theater. Everything happens over here for me. So coming to the theater, I was taking police permissions twice a week to just come and see the place. That's how important this space is for me. And uh, I know that's not good. I know I'll have to kind of cut this umbilical cord at some point of time and stop behaving uh, like someone who will go crazy if this link does not exist. But uh, it has I mean, this lockdown, locked up at home, has brought me face to face I, with many many uh, absences, many presences, many uh, strengths. I knew, I knew I was tested very early in life and uh, tested by fire to live alone. So living alone is no big deal. Counting the tiles in the roof is no big deal for me. I've done it 
I've been down in bed for nine months and counted the tiles. But uh, this time it was different. This time it was really uh, walking around in a two acre farm that I've been living on for 36 years, but uh, never had the time after having planted the trees to actually count how many branches had grown. So here was me reveling in, wow, look at each tree. And I've had four months to watch these trees also grow in, from little buds to flowers and then the flowers falling. It's been a great moment for me to actually just calm down this pause and uh, read a lot catch up with a lot of reading that one doesn't do during when the world is busy, keeping you busy. And uh, I think the, the intrusion of the Zoom call has probably increased a lot. The mobile phone becoming a little more important in one's life because of the WhatsApp calls and uh, keeping in touch with family kind of a thing. But otherwise, I, I do not think uh, it's been a bad idea. I really don't think. I was thinking that it's a good idea if the world could decide to shut down for a month every year and everybody could take this, this pause. I think this is, in some cases, it has brought a lot of people face to face with horrors and skeletons in the cupboard, but uh, not so for me. Uh, it's been a great time for to reckon with the past, to reckon with what one can do going ahead. How is one going to harness whatever energies are there for, uh, for the art? I worry a lot about the youngsters in theater and the performing arts in India because uh, it almost seems like they cannot dream. They don't know what to dream of. And it becomes our responsibility to give them back their dreams. So such are the thoughts that come to me right now. But by and large, good. I learned the sign language. So what I did was I got nine other artists from Bangalore Theater. And uh, we had an institution teach us the sign language. And I realized, oh my god, why don't they teach the sign language to us when we are in school? And why don't any of us have friends who are challenged? Because they go to separate schools. Everything is segregated in the way we have structured our society. So lots of these little lessons have come to me bang between the eyes. Like Ranga Shankara can be a little more interactive, can really have relationships with the audiences without money or buying the ticket as the bottom line of the space. What can we do to heal society? And how can we reach out with counseling maybe for our audiences? I guess for me, this has really been my most biggest preoccupation, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Aru. I think compared to the, uh, all the women in front of me, I think your, um, your profession has really had to very quickly understand that just performing is no longer possible. And what is performance without an audience? So it has had to rapidly deal with uh, new kinds of creativity, but also extreme loss of livelihood. So we'll come to that in a bit. So here we have all for, I mean, I've written down some of the marvelous words that we heard, and maybe later on, um, I can just bring them back as we end the program. But we heard from a, it was so diverse, all the things that all of you said. For me also, before I ask the next question, the last few months have been a period of deep reflection and a sense of gratitude. Some of you said a, a sense of pausing and pausing in a very good way um, because it allows you uh, to renew yourself, right? To throw off the unnecessary. And um, it's like Daniel Gilbert says in Stumbling on Happiness, you know, when you actually, you think that somebody else's life, suppose they've had a, a an accident, even say Aru's case, you think, oh my God, how are they ever going to make it? But when you're in that experience, you actually find the resilience, as uh, Rekha said, there's a lot of resilience in us and you stumble upon happiness. So somehow in these six months, I've learned to stumble upon happiness and also learned a lot about myself and the world. So um, it's been a time of reflection, 
a time of privilege, gratitude, and creativity in some ways. So, um, you know, now I'm going to ask all of you, and in no particular order, if you want to raise your hands, that's fine too, to talk about the future of your professions. Many of, everything has changed profoundly, and some things may come back to routine, some may not. So, um, uh, does anyone particularly want to go first? What has changed in your professions? So, as you look into the future, uh, what is going to have to be different? Gita, you want to go first? I think that um, in a way, in a similar manner to Aru, I think education is going through a tremendous trauma. Uh, we, are, we are seeing a simplistic, one-dimensional kind of solution. Uh, and for somebody like me who has worked with digital technologies for over two decades, it, 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 is, um, it is the cut and paste of a simple answer on what is a monumental problem. Uh, when we, and, and I'm talking about my sector as education, I will come to my sector as design, but at the moment I'm looking at the sector of education. And perhaps the vision that I have as I talk to you is a, is a small photograph that my daughter-in-law sent me from Delhi of my seven-year-old grandson with his head down on the keyboard because he has six hours of Zoom classes a day. I mean, and he's seven years old. And, and I think that the four-year-old has three hours of it with short breaks. So I think the, edu the, the whole sector is in crisis. Uh, it is in crisis for a different reason from what Aru was talking about. It is about trying to fill the space with something that comes from another era, another technology, another knowledge system, cutting and pasting on this just to survive as institutions. Yeah. And I think that this is not something that is going to be solved very easily un until people start doing a lot more introspection about what exactly we want to do in education, especially in this year of a pandemic. I think that most people are hoping that oh, it will be short term, but I think the changes in all our lives are going to be long term. They're not, they're not necessarily going to be short term. Business as usual, may not ever come back because of what we've learned during the pandemic. There has been a lot of change. You yourself are talking about renewing yourself. You know, Aru is talking about her theater now reaching out in different ways. We're all now in this act of reimagination. And I think that for, for myself, the horizon that I set myself is the seven-year-old and the four-year-old and not the pandemic. I'm, I'm asking what, the, what will the education sector look like for the seven-year-old when he is as old as I am. And I have crossed seven decades, right? So I, if I am over 70 today, my grandson who's seven will be 70 in 2083. And my granddaughter who's four today will be 70 in 2086. And it's a realistic line. It's a realistic line. So when we put that kind of scale to education, we have to understand that the current normal just being cut and pasted with technology is not the answer. It is definitely not the answer. Uh, and the answer is um, also highlights our, our lack of investment in the sector, despite what everybody in, on this panel has done and despite what so many people all across the country have been talking about. We haven't actually solve the inequity uh, issues. Uh, you know, the, the fact that people are now walking around trying to put their gold jewelry and hawk it to buy a smartphone because the only classes they're getting on WhatsApp show, shows that we, we have not even begun to address what the sectoral issues are, are in education. I think that in the, in the, in the long term, we have hope because I know that the human imagination will rise up to the occasion and people will start looking at small success models um, around the world and around India and, and make, make education more locally relevant, more proximate to problems that are there. Perhaps one of the best examples came on a Ashoka University webinar where they were also talking about the future in many ways. And the point uh, was made by Gitanjali uh, who is the director of Sonam Wangchuk's Himalayan Institute of Al Alternative Learning, HIAL. 
And she said, well, I'm not having a problem, you know, because we're talking about what's happening in Ladakh. We're talking about agriculture. We're talking about solar architecture. We're talking about how to manage your life and make it better. And the people who come here are actively engaged in learning. Now she's lucky, I told her, you know, in the thing. She's lucky and she's fortunate that she has a residential community that she can continue. But our urban cities are not planned for that. Our, our uh, institutions are built on top of urban uh, metros. Uh, rural institutions are also different. So I think that this is what I closed my earlier few minutes of talk, that this is the imagination that is alive inside me today, is how do we construct the future for 2086, not for 2021. Now, I may not be here in 2086, but I definitely want that future for my grandchildren not and my great-grandchildren. And I think that we need to look at what are the knowledge systems that we want to keep going and what are the knowledge systems we can give up. And, and in my own search, uh, the last closing remarks, in my own search, and this is inclusive of design education too, I felt that one has to look for something that's timeless. You know, in the search for timelessness, the search for something that endures and persists. We all want to communicate, Rohini. We all want to talk. We all want to share. We all want to be able to do things that have persisted across many civilization breakthroughs but we don't need to put everybody on a Charlie Chaplin modern times conveyor belt. That image of, of a Henry Fordist kind of educational model, industrial revolution sparked. Now the digital revolution is here, but it's not just cut and paste on the industrial revolution. Knowledge has to be examined for itself. And I close with three things, and I'm coming now moving to design education. I think that design education is sometimes talked about as a vaccine, right? That, um, that it provides immunity to institutions and businesses, they're not going to fail. Suddenly you're going to spark a hundred startups uh, that are going to make everybody wealthy overnight. It's not a vaccine. It's going to provide no immunity at all in current circumstances. And, and again, uh, it's, it, the, the result is that we have to move from thinking about that as extractive to something that is co-created, that is collaborative, and is not just serving in an industry that is building on lifestyle, consumption, and mobility, but is looking at a lifestyle, which you've talked about, all of you today, what you value, proximity, intimacy, resilience, and generosity. I think the act of giving itself has to come into the system in a very big way, not the act of taking. We have to make, not take in the new model. That's the way I look at it. Thank you. Uh, that was very important. And I love your last line, designing for giving, not taking. Uh, I think that's truly beautiful. And I can think of so many threads from there. Uh, who wants to go next, Rekha? Um, if I had to look at our industry as a whole, um, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's really uh, having to, and the word's been used by Gita, saying having to reimagine our businesses, reimagine, you know, there are certain industries, as we know, that have uh, 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 shrunk and certain other industries that have benefited, you know, certain sectors that have shrunk and certain uh, uh, other industries that have benefited. I mean, you know, if you just see uh, tourism and travel and, uh, you know, a lot of the services industry has shrunk. Uh, and uh, paradoxically, that also, and we can come to that topic later, also employs the largest number of women uh, who then, you know, that's also impacted them in terms of what's happened in the labor force. Uh, and but there are others that are doing really well. Uh, and digital is really has been the thread that has pulled them up. And I was just reflecting um, on what Gita was saying. And I said that, and I was saying that, thinking about it and saying, yes, um, this is, we are witnessing uh, um, the largest changes ever. You know, this is more than a health and economic crisis, it's also a societal crisis. Um, there is no roadmaps anymore. Um, and we'll have to reimagine both, the, as I said, the businesses, but we also have to reimagine the social contracts 
because the same digital that is creating a technology that is creating uh, a, a, a lot of opportunities, innovative opportunities, could also be leaving people behind. And, and at the same time, the same technology could be used to be inclusive. Um, and if I just look at education um, or healthcare, um, two big needs in India right now, uh, and look at innovative technologies that could then democratize the reach um, to the underserved with new models, not the old models, but with new models. And I think there's a big opportunity there. But so your, sector, your sector, the IT sector, especially in India from what I'm seeing, Infosys, Wipro, DTS, Accenture, everybody else, you all seem to be doing well. Do you want to briefly talk about, because you're already digital and you didn't need, many of your employees are working from home. So in that sense, your sector has suffered less, right? But is there any couple of words? Yeah, yes. you understand yeah, so that? Our sector, no, so our sector... Uh, uh, will will I will the IT sector completely redesign its infra, its buildings because um, the way people will meet in the future as well, assuming that we're out of the pandemic by end of next year? So we're not going back to what we were doing earlier. So one, from a sector perspective, yes, the IT sector um, survived and did well only because we had already gone digital well ahead of the curve. Uh, and, and that was also true, not just of our sector, but any sector where any company that had moved on the digital cycle earlier survived and did well actually, and took, uh, took uh, the, this as an opportunity actually to expand businesses and grow. So business resilience and growth both happened for our sector because we were already there getting back as we get back to work when the, as you said when the pandemic uh, uh, ends uh, when and if it ends and we none of us see the future of the workplace in the same fashion as we did before we'll have to redesign it whether it's with uh, uh, focus on health and social distancing but also think through the community needs of our people that still have to be met but it also gives us opportunities. I mean, just one opportunity. You can now tap talent anywhere. Um, it doesn't have to be in the metros uh, of India. It can be uh, outside of the metros of India and therefore gives more job opportunities. It also provides, back to the gender issue, uh, uh, more women the opportunity to uh, flexibly work from home if they want to, and maybe we bring more women in. Um, but one big focus we'll all have to have is skilling because the uh, a shift in what's happening and the kind of uh, jobs that are coming in and the sectors that are changing, I mean, the areas that are changing, we all have to focus on that. Um, so it'll have to be a lot more uh, workforce resilience. It'll all, all have to be uh, a lot more focus on a continuous skilling of our people, on skill building. And it'll also have to be the boundaries have shifted. So you can't do it to go alone. Um, the you can't work on your isolated self anymore. So organizations need to collaborate uh, across uh, with society, with governments, with policymakers, uh, and open up and collaborate and come with new innovative solutions. Uh, thank you. So collaboration and being able to discover talent anywhere, thereby democratizing opportunity and access. Uh, thank you. Nirupan, I'm going to come to you because uh, the world of diplomacy has gone through so much shocks even before the pandemic already things seemed really upside down or turned around now with this pandemic can you dwell a bit on how diplomacy skill i mean this reskilling that she's talking about maybe diplomats also have to think very differently now and when you think of say so speak in that context and speak in the context of the pandemic for example vaccine nationalism right how does india of course, uh, uh, how will countries like India manage to get if their vaccines are going to be developed in the richer countries? Just as one example, how are we going to use diplomacy to make sure we get our fair share of vaccines? As one example, in this topsy-turvy world, talk to us about the future of diplomacy. Well, in terms of uh, diplomacy and um, coming from where I am, it's been my profession. I joined uh, the world of diplomacy way back in 1973 during the height of the Cold War. And all those momentous developments we saw 
uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the end of uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the rise of uh, the United States as a hyperpower, as the French would call them. Uh, one has been witness to all that. And today, one is witness to the phenomenal rise of China in a manner that no, none of us anticipated, because the whole idea of the United States in, uh, in engaging with China and uh, allowing them that space and that opportunity to develop and to integrate themselves, at least economically, with the rest of the world has been, had been built on the presumption that China would democratize, that China would, uh, would uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese political system would evolve in a way that made China more like us. And that hasn't happened. And uh, the manner of China's rise has has evoked a great deal of antagonism in the United States. So people now talk of a new Cold War. So that's why I referred to the image of the Cold War when I joined the world of diplomacy. But is it going to be a new Cold War? How is diplomacy going to be defined in this? What is the role and what is the situation that countries like India are placed in? We are a, a, a rising power in in this part of the world and we have aspirations to become a global leading power. Our economy is already a front ranking economy in purchasing power terms and it's well on the way to also being in actual terms a leading economy if things go along the, the manner in which they were assumed to go at least until two years ago. I understand that the pressures and the and the, down, uh, uh, the downward trends that we are currently confronted with when it comes to the state of our economy. And the pandemic has not uh, uh, helped matters all over the world. The pandemic has created this topsy-turvy world that you're talking of today, even in times of war or um, you know, a natural cataclysm, everything is finite. It lasts for so long. But today, the uncertainty that confronts us, I think, is really uh, causing a great deal of disruption, uh, to use a term that many use today, a great deal of disruption all around in the environment that we see. So what is going to happen to diplomacy after the pandemic? You already have this very, very strong uh, competition bordering on contest, bordering on the threat of conflict between the United States and China. And what reverberations will that create for a country like India? On our own, uh, in our own uh, neck of the woods, we have a very difficult relationship with China, uh, have had, and today it is somewhat compounded by the situation in Ladakh. And uh, that is going to create a lot of um, commitments, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, new assumptions, as far as India is concerned, what is the future of our relationship with China? Is diplomacy the way? Diplomacy is about creating middle ground in whatever we do. It is, a, it is an alternative to war and conflict. Are we prepared? Are we, uh, are we ready to assume that diplomacy will be the path that we follow when it comes to China? Because there are so many reports of the Chinese taking away our territory. Somebody mentioned that it could be 300 square kilometers in Ladakh. I mean, there has been obviously a change of the state, status quo and India wants a restoration of the status quo. But at the same time, we do not want open conflict with China because the impact of that on the economy, on, the, on our you know, state of being, as it were, on, on, the, on our huge business relationship we've built up with China as so many countries have. So this network, we live in a networked world today. So uh, we cannot think of radical change because how do you, you know, completely disrupt all these connections that you have made in the past few decades and in recent years. So that is the challenge and that is the dilemma that is facing all of us and India is no exception to it. I think that this is a world that is not a brave new world, I'm afraid. It's not a brave new world. It is, it's quite a nasty, brutish world that we are going to face after the end of the pandemic. You are going to have a bipolar situation where the US and China are confronting themselves 
in a in a situation of multipolarity because there are so many poles uh, of influence and that's not bad for countries like us multipolarity is not a bad thing because it gives us room for maneuver it enables us to align our interests case by case and uh, we are a country that do not go in for alliances that do not go in for you know uh, the kind of uh, partnerships that the US has, let's say, with Japan and South Korea or the Philippines for that matter. We don't, we don't go into that, we don't follow that direction. But at the same time, the situation with China entails us to uh, not only recognize that this is a turning point in our diplomacy and our foreign policy, but it also requires us to uh, determine what kind of uh, alignments that we need on a case by case basis, on an issue by issue basis with the countries in the region as also with superpowers like the United States. The relationship with China on the one hand and the relationship with the US on the other hand are these two sort of ends of, of this spectrum. But in between, there is scope for maneuverability. There is scope for us to promote not only the internal balancing that we need, but also the external balancing that we need. So uh, you spoke of balance, you spoke of middle ground, you spoke of, so uh, let me, I will come to you a little later. The time is running out so fast and I have so many questions, but quickly, one thing I did want you all to say, the leadership of women at times like this, you know, we talked a little bit of ageism, but the leadership of women, especially say in your, uh, in diplomacy in Arupama, is there a difference in the way women leaders uh, handle issues of the middle ground? Do you think there is a different, a more, a more, we talk of women as nurturers, as those who are, I mean, the, the macho, powerful, dominant sort of male kind of leadership. Is that really different? And do we need more women diplomats is there a difference when women leaders are in diplomacy or at the helm of affairs there are nine women uh, women leaders leading countries to this the, now and it, most of them seem to have done better through the pandemic managing the countries in the pandemic and um, i don't want to be sexist about women either but do you have something to say almost all of you and Aru, you can use that question to then talk about your part about the future of your industry but nirupam very quickly women leaders what do you think well i think certainly you cited the example of the pandemic and the leadership provided by these nine women leaders in the time of the pandemic and uh, the kind of pragmatism and the kind of uh, precision and the uh, the consistency i like geeta mentioned you know resilience and generosity i would add to resilience i would uh, i would talk about precision i would talk about pragmatism i would talk about consistency sorry did you Consist hear consistency so i think these are qualities that definitely women bring to leadership and diplomacy is no exception i would also say that diplomacy is not a field where machismo is the predominant definition it has never been through the ages it's another thing that women have not been in diplomacy you found very few women diplomats. That situation is changing today. You have many more women diplomats in the field and India, I think, uh, is also, has also increased uh, the quotient of women in the Foreign Service, for instance. And uh, when I joined the Foreign Service, uh, it was ex very, very rare for women to be handling sensitive desks in the Ministry of External Affairs. But uh, by the time I uh, uh, you know, rose in the ranks of the service, things were changing. For instance, I handled uh, desks like China and I went to Sri Lanka as High Commissioner, I was ambassador in China. All that could, could not have been conceived of a generation ago. So I think in that sense, the world has opened up for us. The world is far more welcoming of the woman diplomat. But in terms of diplomacy as a profession itself, you, you know that, era when diplomats were sequestered in ivory towers and they poured cocktails in the in the evening and you know lived in a very rarefied atmosphere all that has changed you know we are out in the trenches we work with people communication has changed strategic communication is so important today the timing the moment so whether it's a woman or a man 
uh, change is in the air and you have to embrace change and you cannot follow the traditional bureaucratic approach that we will go by precedent, we will go by what is tried and tested. We should be able to deal with the unfamiliar. That is so important today. Well, I personally am rooting for more women diplomats. Rekha, very quickly, and then Geeta, and then we'll go to Aru, and then if you have to open it up for questions. So anybody wants to ask anyone anything, please start writing in the chat box so that I can pick up your questions once this round is over. Very quickly, Rekha, women leaders. Have you called upon to demonstrate more leadership now? And generally, your thoughts on uh, is the world better off having more women in leadership positions? So uh, the answer to that would be yes. Uh, uh, we need more women leaders. We don't have enough of them in the corporate sector. And I'm speaking to the corporate sector and we need more of them. And it's not because uh, uh, they are better or worse. Leadership, uh, good leadership is similar, men or women, I would say. We just need more of them because we don't have enough and we need a balance and we need equality. And I think leaders have been called upon in this time um, to rise to the challenge and display, if I would use the word tentatively, their feminine energies rather than male or female leaders being better. That's where I would go because it's been about how do you take care of your people? It's been about compassion and caring. It's about courage to lead in ambiguity. And it's the courage to change um, because None of us know what's uh, the exact roadmap. Um, it's also leading with a little bit of uh, humility and getting feedback from everywhere, doing the right thing for the people. Uh, so it's leadership with certain feminine energies is what I would say. And uh, it's not more uh, that women make better leaders than men. Um, they are good leaders and bad leaders. And yes, we need far more women leaders in the corporate world. Gita, I have many questions, so now I have to start taking them pretty soon. So briefly, yeah, on I, my, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I think that um, in education, the field uh, leadership is slightly different from the other sectors, such as Rekha is talking about business and and uh, yeah, but also design, which for me is so important and critical it's to be future. Fact, you see, we've had great icons, leadership in education and in design. We, we, we haven't really had uh, in, in our country uh, and uh, across the world uh, the, the gender divide on, on leadership. Now, really, the question is, what is leadership, right? Is leadership heading an institution or is leadership being in the front, you know, the first among equals going out there? Uh, so is it brand leadership? Is it uh, the next idea? Are you a leader? Are you somebody who's, whom other people are going to follow? So I, I really think about leadership in three different ways. Uh, one is the fact that yes, uh, leadership of institutions, which is what I have done. And I've been, uh, I have been influenced by great mentors uh, uh, in Bangalore, Tara Chandavaka being one of them, uh, indomitable into her late eighties, being the icon, iconic leader that she was. Uh, she never ever gave up. Her enthusiasm, her, her, her love of being in so many different uh, fields at the same time and the connections that she maintained is becomes the iconic person who's aging but who did not give up her leadership. Um, now, if you if you go into the set into what leadership actually means, uh, for me, leadership has always meant and from from the examples of people I've said is the ability to see. You know, you have to be able to have a vision, you have to be able to see, you have to have a horizon. And that is institutional. You take people with you. But that, if you do not have within a leader, and I think women, when we are leaders, for many of the points that uh, Rekha made, uh, the kind of uh, the feminineness within us allows us to see with many different facets of our being. Uh, I don't think men are not capable of it. I agree with Rekha. I think men also have that side, but they sometimes uh, don't get to it. Uh, but if you say that the institution and the leadership of institution is about the ability to see, and that's how you define it, leadership in academia or leadership in design or leadership is in proof. People want evidence of your leadership. You know, They want to see your ideas tested. They want it validated. They want, it, uh, want to know where else it can go. And so that needs a different kind of stamina because you might have 
have a certain amount of proof, but if you are a leader, you're going to have to rise up and take it into a whole different realm and then say that, that that's what leadership does. And the third is at the level of people, right? One is at the level of ideas, academic, proof, evidence, analysis, uh, exhibiting, talking, convincing. The other is to be able to see, to envision, to imagine, to, to bring what is not possible in, or probable into the language of the everyday. But the last is at the language of human relationships. It is about community. And leadership is about doing and building that community through actual networking, talking, making time, um, listening to other people, the ability to listen. Sometimes when we're talking about the feminine leader and the masculine leader, the masculinity in leadership is often associated with efficiency mm -hmm. and not with effectiveness. We, you know, the, the softer parts of ma management or the softer parts of administration mm -hmm. are decried as being too soft or feminine. And we end up with language of managerialism. We link, end up with languages where the efficient administrator is valued. I don't think that that actually is quantifiable in quite those terms, but they are black and white and they do have gender connotations to them. Uh, and if somebody is sensing their way through a problem, people want the hard facts. They want the, the, the administrative uh, thing. So I think that leadership includes managerialism. It doesn't exclude it. It includes uh, this whole idea of administration, but managerialism in the end is a ring binder to me. And uh, administration is just the ability to sort, categorize, allocate, and provide. So yeah. leadership is something much more. And I think that mm -hmm. empowerment comes from all of us. I don't want to separate it into men and women, okay. but I think we have it in all of us to be leaders. Sure, we but just if I, have to dare. I, I, I agree with you. But if I asked you as a woman leader, yeah. three words, just three words, describe to me as a woman leader, what did you focus on? Just three words. I, I focused on envisioning. I focused on obstinacy, not giving up. Right? I never give up. So I, I mean, I mean, Aru is laughing, but you just cannot give up. Right? So you envision, you're envision. obstinate, and you stick to, what, to, to doing something. And you have to be able to have, have be able to laugh. Laugh. If you can't laugh at yourself and you can't laugh at other people, people are going to take pot shots at you all the time. That's so right whether it's ageism or gender, you're going to have to be able to shrug it off. And humor is very important. Thank you. That was so important. So to, uh, on the lighter side, we used to say our vision should be 2020, but we might have to change that because 2020 didn't turn out to be perfect vision after all. Okay, Alu. Uh, over to you now, and then I'm literally going to read out people's questions. Otherwise, our audiences are going to get upset with us. So I will yeah. take your three, four minutes, and then I'm just going to read out some questions for all of you to answer. Please go ahead, Aru. Okay, so quickly, I will uh, uh, do a recap on what the post-independence scenario in our Indian uh, society was, with a lot of pressure on making the male child the bureaucrat or the successful engineer, the professional in short, the doctor, all these uh, courses and all these jobs were kind of what the male child aspired to become and could become also because of the way matrimony was designed. I mean, women had to leave and go to other places whatever that is. But uh, thanks to that, I think there was a very large liberal arts area which was left free for women to enter into. And uh, we, we saw, we, we reaped the benefit of that 20 years later, when uh, at one point of time, in fact, about maybe 10 years ago, if you looked at uh, the art sector in India, every important post was occupied by a woman whether it was the head of the National School of Drama, or it was Prithvi Theatre, or it was Ranga Shankara, or in Bengal, you had Usha Ganguly. Every, every important creative theatre person was a woman. What happened? Something happened along the way. The men kind of were not there. And what happened when, these, when the women came into leadership was, they did not exclude the men. 
So I think we've, it, the, what happened in the art sector is something worth emulating in a sense. When you had Amal Alana heading the National School of Drama, it did not mean that Amal brought only women into uh, the picture. She really helped nurture a whole lot of men and other people across the country. So I think uh, that trend is something worth understanding. I have benefited a lot from that little gap that allowed a woman who was just an actor to become a dreamer and to really uh, uh, make this happen, make the the theater happen. And it has had its own problems. I did realize being a woman was not so easy because even while uh, constructing uh, the space, there were many a times there were issues that I had to call Satyu to help me out with. Uh, because uh, being a woman, if I put my foot down and I said, no, this has got to be like this, I was uh, called obstinate or I was called arrogant. Whereas if a man says the same things, they're called, wow, efficient. So I had to call Satyu and I got my way. So like many of us know how to manipulate, know how to make things happen because otherwise they don't happen. We know how to do it. We call the right people and say, okay, sir, I'm going to put the gun on your shoulder and shoot. Will you allow me to do it? So a lot has been achieved by uh, being sensible and uh, awake in that sense. Completely, completely uh, conscious of the fact that when it comes from a woman, it is not taken so easily. There are many spheres in the in, in Indian society which don't allow it. So, uh, I'll come to the sector now. That, ah. Yeah, yeah, very quickly. Yeah. I'll, I'll come quickly to this sector. I think the sector is the most battered. And uh, we are sitting at an extremely important point of time in history where uh, we have the distant past and we have the future. Whereas we are sitting here now today. And if we allow things to fall through the cracks, we're going to be left with an empty bowl because that is what today could be. We are not, we haven't codified, we haven't preserved, we haven't documented enough. And India is the richest country as far as performance practices goes, languages, cultural wisdom, knowledge, call it anything, all these soft skills which, were, which are part of the societal fabric, really. If, if there is resilience in the Indian today, it is because there is a history to it. If, if there is something beautiful, if I'm wearing something beautiful, it has come over hundreds and thousands of years and we have no business to lose that wisdom. So I think we're sitting at an extremely important juncture in the history of mankind. So we need this... We need support, we need people, evangelists to wake up that if that goes away, we, we don't have the wherewithal, we do not have the economic capacity to uh, uh, fund that kind of activity which will actually preserve this wisdom. We need the evangelists to come in. We need the, we need the sectors to wake up really to fund excellence in our society. We have had a lot of nepotism that has made money. We have had a lot of uh, support going the wrong way. Feudalism has contributed to the kind of uh, Bollywood structures where you see uh, sons of actors who cannot hold a candle to the father, but they become heroes. And uh, that's because there is so much of parental support. This is the fallout of feudalism. We don't have that in theater. So we really need support that will uh, fund excellence. Maybe the IITs and the IIMs can uh, hire artists in residency. Corporates can hire artists in residency and keep them in rotation. This will make for some kind of corporate responsibility of taking art to the actual worker who's sitting there on the computer and doesn't have a clue doesn't have a clue. So there are a lot of these kind of measures that need to come in at an, at an extremely fast rate. Otherwise, that artist, that weaver, that craftsperson or that actor is going to become a daily laborer taking MNRE, GA money. Yes. Yeah, that's it. No, I think that's very urgent. You know, in we run about our lives 
we forget, though we are a nation of storytellers and a nation of such exquisite art and crafts people, we forget how important art and culture and the performing arts are to help us make sense of chaos, to help us through grief, to help us through uncertainty, to make some meaning of our lives. So Aru has given us some ways where there must be a hundred ways where all of us can support the performing arts. And it's a good wake up call for us to do that, especially now when the pandemic has thrown so much into chaos. Um, so there are Teyam, there are Teyam artists in Kerala who are Harijans. They are really down at the bottom of the line and they are starving. What happens to them? There are Yakshagana artists, there are Kuriyattam artists. And these are old performance practices. Almost some of them are 2000 years old. They just fall through the cracks. Like you said, we have no business losing our heritage. Thank you for that wake up call. I have to take questions for the short time we have remaining. One of the themes in the question seems to be uh, about work at home, work from home, and the special stress that it might bring on the woman. We know domestic violence cases have really risen in the last five months. We know that anyway, women are put you know, put into stereotypes and roles of what they must be doing at home. So taking on the burden of the home and the family and work. Quick comments from any of you, just raise your hand so I can just call you. Rekha, go ahead. So I would agree. Uh, while work from home has uh, provided the opportunity for women um, to, uh, to uh, continue and not be disruptive in their lives, it has also put a burden for exactly the reasons that you said, because culturally they're having to do work from home and work off home at the same time. So they are having to deliver on both fronts and that's putting a lot of stress on them. There are also a lot of um, mental health issues that are starting to come up. Um, there are, as you said, domestic violence, which is getting unreported now. Um, so those are the big areas we need to watch for and support and help because that could be the next pandemic. Mental health issues could be the next pandemic. Okay. Aru? Yeah, uh, we have already made a large plan, as I said, to the repurposing of our ground floor of Rangashankara, and that is reaching out to people in our immediate vicinity of, say, three kilometers radius. And we are looking at doing counseling sessions, letting our audiences know any woman or any man who needs help, well, we are going to have uh, psychiatrist friends coming and doing counseling sessions at Rangashankara. So we're really uh, uh, opening. We, we believed that theater was uh, therapeutic and theater was working like the psychiatrist was a kind of silent, silently there posing the problems and showing solutions which you could agree or disagree with and learn from. All that has gone. And so how can we repurpose ourselves? So we said, let's hit it on the head and say, we are here to help you. You can come. We will have leading psychiatrists actually doing sessions. So we are looking at Rangashankara becoming this space that is about well-being and about holding hands. Uh, yeah, not quite holding hands, with gloves maybe. Gita? <laughs> uh -huh. uh I think that I agree with, you know, uh, about Rekha and Aru. And uh, I, we have an additional problem here. We have the problem that women are working from home and their children are studying at home. And they have to do their domestic work. And they're just not, first and foremost, what are they to do? Are they to go clock on at nine o'clock to their bosses or eight o'clock? Or do they at eight o'clock clock on and lock their children down? And the online schooling system definitely needs a parent behind there because you cannot leave a child unsupervised on the internet. And the schools are expecting that kind of cooperation from parents. And if you have more than one child and in two different schools, uh, you then have a shortage of devices. You can't actually have working times which collab go on with school times. And then you have to do your domestic chores as well. So the kind of feedback I'm getting from women uh, is the fact that they are really falling apart. Uh, they are really falling apart. And the kind of uh, requests that have come to me as the head of uh, an institution is to say that, uh, can you find some way for, to help us manage this? You know, can, can you find some way to help us manage the fact that uh, 
I have two children and I have to sit with them because my school says that I have to sit with them and I have only one laptop I have to manage. They are incredibly stressed. So it's not just that I'm a housewife and I'm a teacher, but I'm a working woman, I'm a teacher, I have to help my child with the homework and I have to co work with, within the frame that my husband is also working from home. Uh, we have found it. I think that I will draw a little bit on Aru's thing about having helping to with counseling, but uh, people don't really necessarily want that. They just they just want to know how they can get a break. And at this moment, it's a very hard life. I think I think we're hearing this a lot more now uh, for, that women are getting really really stressed out with the number of roles they have to play in 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 a small physical place, which is the home, which is now the workplace and everything else. Well, the, the workplace, the school, and uh, also managing more of the family. One has had never been so much with one's family as one has been in the last five months, which can be both good and bad. So I think as a society, we are going to have to step back a little and say we don't need to do it all. Maybe you don't, everybody doesn't have to do everything and we have to find some creative way is out of that. Some of the other questions which I think we must give prominence to because I've titled this thing Grey Matters and people are feeling a bit cheated that you all haven't talked enough about ageism, which is what we started with. So um, anybody, you know, this thing about old people being, uh, you know, Shashi Deshpande wrote a beautiful article in Scroll on how she feels as an old woman. She feels almost rejected, like this whole idea of I, I hate to use the word culling, but sort of I'm having older people become slightly disposable, you know, and the idea of triage that if a young person and an old person are in a hospital and if the hospital doesn't have enough resources, that age is considered an okay thing to be a filter. Anyone wants to talk about that because it's such an important issue for society when actually societies all over the world are graying. Right, India will have 300 million old people over the age of 65 in 2050, which is not, not as far as we think it is now. Geeta is talking about 2086. So some thoughts and comments on that, but very quickly, we're running out of time. Yes, Nirupama, please. You have to uh, talking about ageism and uh, when it comes to my experience now, I retired in 2013, it's been seven years. So strictly speaking, one should have just uh, receded into the shadows and, and have been forgotten. But what has happened during this pandemic is a total, I feel that I have actually um, experienced a sort of rebirth of sorts because I, the kind of uh, requests uh, to me for opinion, for, um, based on my experience on what I can offer to the current debate on foreign policy. All that has literally come alive in these last uh, four or five months. So technology, uh, in a sense, has become, become an aid, uh, become a, a helper, become a, become, become a source of support, as it were. So when the isolation aspect of what retirement entails seems to have sort of faded into the background, because I've never been as busy as I have been in the last couple of months dealing with matters con concerning my profession. I mean, earlier, of course, it was what I did if I chose to write something or if I was invited to a conference here or there. But here you don't have the issue of travel. You know, anybody can reach out to you from any corner of the earth. So in a sense, that has been quite a, a refreshing change. But I'm not saying that the misery of the pandemic uh, should cause any of us that kind of, uh, you know, feeling of, uh, uh, of hope about one's own existence, as it were. But I just wanted to say in the midst of solitude, in the midst of isolation, this new connectedness has also grown. Rekha? I was going to say that in a way, uh, ageism um, has... Uh, uh, is also a prejudice, just like sex, uh, sexism and race, racism, but you know it's a very invisible pre uh, prejudice because it gets couched under care for the elderly because you're thinking about the elderly and therefore they need to be put away. I'm not put away, but you know taken care of, or they need to retire, etc. Um, so there is that, and we need to be mindful uh, of it and work towards it. So that's point one. The other one actually is that uh, we. And if it's women and ageism, then it's a double whammy. 
um, because you see, especially in the workplace, then it's a double whammy. Um, though on the flip side of that, uh, all studies have shown that younger uh, men uh, feel less threatened by older women bosses than older men bosses for some reason. They find that they are more, either more compassionate or caring or they are not fighting for the same spot, whatever it may be. Um, and we need to just think through that. And to the point Nirupma made, uh, there is a lot of value add that the older people do. It's not that they retire and disappear into the darkness. The number of startups that they're doing, the, uh, uh, the experience that they bring to the table. So that's not an issue, but it will have to be an adaptable issue. As you said, we'll have to think through as a society, how do you structure work so that both the young and the old uh, uh, can add their own bits to it because both bring things to the table. So it's not one or the other. Uh, um, Aru, also, is, is the attitude towards the old changing in Indian society? Is, are we becoming a little more Western in the sense that otherwise we used to venerate the old, right? You used to fall at their feet in the mornings and take their blessings before you went out of the day for the day. Is that changing? Are you feeling anything like that? Aru? Uh, uh, well, we are, not, we are not sensing it around us in the middle class uh, theater audiences that come to our uh, theater or among the youngsters who are performing. They are also from the middle class. I don't find that uh, irrever irreverence to the knowledge that is in the elder. It's, right. not, it's not here, at least among our Kannada cross-section. Okay. It, it is not there, whether they are from the IT sector or they are highly qualified, but somehow something has remained in the traditional values within the middle class Kannadiga audience that I have been exposed to and whom I meet quite often, at least now we have not met them for six months. But uh, yes, it is there. Mm. <laughs> So I, I also just wanted to park one uh, uh, thing that my brother said to me that in Japan, apparently when a senior person retires from a country, company, uh, they don't send him away. They keep him at half wages because he, the knowledge that he holds, he or she holds mostly he in Japan because they're so, so male dominated. <laughs> but they retain the person. They don't park the person on a sofa and say, okay, now you stay there. I thought that was such a brilliant idea, you know, of retaining continuity and people and not saying that, okay, you did your bit and now I'm going to come and change everything to keep that continuum. How do you make older people feel included? It's a huge uh, question uh, for society going forward. We are going to have to uh, resolve it. All the world is getting older, though sometimes, right now it's a very young world, but if you look at the demographic uh, uh, patterns coming just a few years from now, we're going to be an old world. Uh, Gita, any thoughts on, do you feel old? I don't feel old. And I'm going to be 71. And next year, I am going to have spent 50 years as a classroom teacher. And I can still get up and hold a class together. I don't feel old at all, but I have a point here. I think that ageism, like Rekha said, does exist in society. And uh, one of the things that has always annoyed me and is always about people coming and saying, uh, when are you going to stop working, Gita? When are you going to get a life, right? I have a life. My work is my life. Whether I'm an earning member or not, it's like Aru, I only did one thing. I've been an educator and I've been a teacher. What I may have moved from just teaching maths to teaching design, but I'm still a teacher and I'm still passionate about it. I still love to see my kids. I know who they are and I know their names uh, all the way through all the years that I have taught them. So the thing that is there as when you say about ageism is that there is a fear as our numbers grow and we do retire because we stop earning. So the retirement is really the time when you say, I won't, I'm not, there's not a price to my head, but I come free. I, I am still working, I'm still giving, I'm still creating, I'm still energetic, and I can provide for a lot of things. But I don't need, I don't need to earn any money. But this notion about um, the space for older people and how they can contribute as the larger as the in the, the number of people who are older increases 
is going to be something that we have to look at. I mean, the US doesn't have anything like a retirement age, right? They just say you, you go on and you can do something. So I, I don't feel a sense, yes, my body is frail. I might be larger or I might have creakier bones and I might complain about my back and, and so on. But there's nothing wrong with my mind. There's nothing wrong with my energy. And there's nothing wrong with the passion that I bring to my work. And uh, I think that um, that, has not, that has not dimmed at all in, in nearly 50 years. Now, in, in 2021, in July, it will be 50 years since I be went into a classroom to start teaching. And I don't, feel, I don't feel I have to apologize for it. I just feel that I'm happy about it. And I would like to keep doing it as long as I can. Thank you. That's why I chose the four of you as powerful role models for how to age strongly, gracefully. But the fact is that when you look around society, um, actually women who live longer, who may not have looked after their own health more than because they were busy looking after the health of the family, who may not have property of their own, who may have to have new dependencies because of their economic frailty, have a double whammy when, as they get older. And so it's very good to hear all of you talk coming from your strength but also coming from compassion and empathy. So that's something to remember. Quickly, um, the questions people are asking, which also I, uh, I wanted to talk about digital grandparenting, you know, but there's no time, but people have asked, is there something new that each of you did in these last, something new you did in these last six months? And people want to know, does spirituality play any role in your life? Can you answer both these things very, um, very briefly? Because we are now at eight o'clock, uh, 7.57, eight o'clock was our cutoff time. I'm going to take a 10 extra minutes unless Raghu shuts us all down. Uh, so please answer this, all four of you. Aru, go first. Okay, quickly. Uh, what I did was I did a digital uh, film on uh, how f friends can reach out and just make a call if you have a friend who has corona. And my director was sitting in Bombay. I was sitting in Bangalore and we shot the film and he put it together and it was there. So for me, it was like a great learning on how one can reach out to people in this lockdown time and meaningful. It was a little film, no money involved, just doing it for the love of it. I learned sign language. I cooked up many, many dreams for youngsters in, in the space of theater, livelihoods. I called people, I called a, a horticultural graduate to come and teach gardening to unemployed actors who can then grow their herbs at Rangashankara and sell them. So it's kind of made me into this great sucker who's awake in the middle of the night thinking of, oh my God, how am I going to create livelihoods for youngsters? Yeah. So these are the... Lovely. <laughs> Marvelous, Arun. We expect nothing less from you. I love that cooking dreams part of it. Who's next, Rekha? So I was just going to say, what were the new things that I did? One, I shaved my hair off. Yeah, um, I'm completely bald. I and went bald. And this was a good, good opportunity to do it. Uh, and um, yes, growth on spirituality. Somebody asked the question. There was growth on spirituality because this was a time for reflection and stepping back. Um, and uh, using that opportunity to really um, figure out what was meaning for yourself, meaningful, and therefore the growth in spirituality. And like uh, Aru, spending a lot of time thinking, how do we recreate different livelihoods as people lost traditional livelihoods around us? You know, how do you, if uh, women uh, could be re-employed in trained and re-employed as frontline healthcare workers because they'd lost their jobs in retail, et cetera. Um, and trying to support those initiatives was the new thing to do. That's what you were doing. That's new. Nirupama, new. What was new? Uh, you didn't, yeah. didn't get to talk about your music diplomacy. But anyway, what's, new, what's been new with you for the last six months? Well, the music, uh, you know, using music as a 
as an instrument to bring people together is still very new in my life because yeah. as you know, the foundation I set up is just two years old. So in a way, I'm helping it along. Mention the foundation so people can look it up later. Just uh, The South Asian Symphony Foundation, www.symphonyofsouthasia.org. That's the website. So I uh, continued uh, at, as far as possible to try and keep that alive uh, because we couldn't have concerts at this point of time. So uh, through the medium of technology, through the webinar medium, I had two wonderful conversations. One was a conversation with the Pakistani singer Ali Sethi, uh, which was also hosted by BIC. It was a wonderful conversation and where we talked about the identity that makes us South Asian. You know, you may be Indian or Bangladeshi or Sri Lankan or Pakistani or Nepali or Maldivian, Afghan. Uh, but what is it that keeps us together? What is this cultural construct that, that unites us? And it was a wonderful conversation. And I would highly urge uh, friends and colleagues to look it up. It was published in The Wire. Time. Something new. We look and, yeah. and so that uh, these are new for me because, uh, you know, we were reaching out across... Uh, and you know how difficult it is to reach out to Pakistanis and uh, just to be able to make have this conversation, I think, was something that I really, uh, really did value a great deal. And, uh, you know, there was a line that Ali uh, spoke about in at the end of his conversation, which I think, in a sense, uh, epitomizes what we've been talking about also as slightly older people. Uh, finding uh, new pathways in life and thinking about the future because that is not something normally associated with people of our age. We are thinking about the future. It came across so vividly and graphically in all the conversation that, you know, the fellow panelists ha had. And it's so wonderful. And I also wanted to say in diplomacy and foreign policy, one of the situations that I've always railed against is that we have manners and we don't have women on panels. We have manners. So this is yeah. very different from that. I'm so happy. But these lines that Ali mentioned, um, he mentioned, Gum hue jo raste, mera pata dene lage. So the lost trail, if you translate the lost trail, finds and uh, remembers the way again. I think that is really the message that comes out of all this, the lost trail, remembering the way again. That's really lovely. Uh, we are so much running out of time, but literally in one sentence, could all of you answer my question? What would you say to your younger selves today? Suppose you met your younger selves, say maybe 25 year old uh, Rekha and Nirupama and Gita and Aru or 30 maximum. What would you say to that person? In one sentence, unfortunately, because we don't have time. I'm uh, reminded of uh, Sri Ramakrishna's uh, message, you know, forbearance, forbearance, forbearance. Yeah, about it. Marvelous. Anyone else? Bahut kaam baki hai. Kaam bahut baki hai. Rekha, what would you say to that woman? Uh, I would say, tatvam asi, you are enough and you are complete. Gita? Well, I don't have a quotation, but uh, I think what I would tell my younger self is uh, you really can go out and do what you want, but you just have to be persistent. There's going to be lots of roadblocks. There are going to be lots of things that don't go right. But if you keep going, the end will always be what you want it to be. So it's about endurance. Life is about endurance. It's about make, getting through a bad patch, which is what I tell myself now about the pandemic. So I'm going to bring this kind of to a close by really thanking all of you so much for sharing so beautifully. I wish I could read out, we had time to read out some of the marvelous things that you said. Uh, and um, hashtag lead like a woman has become very popular. So all of you demonstrate that with, without any hashtags or full stops or commas, you're constantly leading and inspiring. And um, I feel like, although as we get older now, I'm 61 and you, you do begin to think of mortality and the pandemic has forced us all, young and old, to think of our mortality. But we've also had the chance to renew ourselves, to rethink, to reflect, to live life one day, one moment at a time. And um, all the years that all of us together have put behind us 
and the years to come i think it's clear that the journey is chalna hi padega raste lambe hai chalte rahenge i hope all of you all are going to be safe to the audience i'm sorry if i couldn't take all your questions i have absolutely no idea where the one and a half hours went we should probably get all these women back again very soon thank you all for being there thank you to bic thank you to my panel thank you thank you so much thank you so much namaste dhanyawad okay. namaste. thank you to all our panels for such a thoughtful and uh, empathetic conversation and uh, uh rekha nirpama arundhati and geeta and uh, thanks to rohini and her masterful moderation where she always gets such important conversations and insights out in the world so thank you for that uh we couldn't agree more with um, her about this dream panel that captures the spirit of bangalore itself with such elegance uh, thank you everyone for joining us today thank you thank you thank you thank so you. much bye bye stay safe <laughs>